Okay, welcome to Procurement Office Hours by Zykus, Accelerating Supplier Enabled Innovation, Harnessing the True Power of Supplier Relationship Management. I'm David Atkinson. Let me, for those that don't know me, I've been in and around the procurement profession for over 30 years. I started out as a buyer for Black & Decker before leading procurement organizations in the automotive and aerospace sectors, including Rolls-Royce. Now, since my practitioner days, I've focused on providing consulting advice and training and coaching to international clients in many different business sectors. Between times, I also lecture at the business school at the University of Birmingham to MBA students, and it's all through my business four pillars. My interest in supply relationship management goes back many, many years, in particular, my experiences in aerospace and automotive. A particular feature of those two sectors, for those that don't know them, is that suppliers are around for a very, very long time because switching can be expensive, it's time consuming, and it's sometimes almost impossible because regulation and custom and practice around safety criticality is a big challenge for those sectors, particularly, particularly for the procurement folks who have to manage relationships. So, in aerospace and automotive, businesses therefore really have little option than to work proactively with suppliers to improve performance and value and do so without the luxury of being able to threaten to resource the business to an alternative supplier. So in these environments, getting the best out of suppliers can be very demanding indeed. So I've since developed my SR, interest in SRM as well as continuing to improve my expertise in the wider procurement field and believe that a pragmatic, systematic and demanding approach to SRM, as well as procurement in general, is preferable to a reliance on goodwill and the sometimes optimistic notion of partnering. So I'm also an experienced uh, practitioner and longtime student of negotiation practice and an accredited trainer from the Harvard MIT program. And I'm acutely aware of the challenges involved in sustaining a supplier network that is genuinely and highly motivated towards helping the buying organization achieve its commercial goals. Innovation really, really matters, and perhaps it's essential to sustain or improve a company's position in the market. For a typical firm today, around 70% of the cost of sales is provided by external suppliers. And so the sources of innovation have shifted from the mainly internal, you know, the creative people inside our uh, design departments and so on, to the wider supplier network, or at least it should do. And as buying companies, you know, it's more a greater recognition now that we can't do it alone. So the idea of working in a much more collaborative way with key suppliers to capture the best ideas has become firmly established as one of the keys to future competitive advantage. Improving functionality, utility and the value of products and services to customers can become and has become to, for many a key deliverable from, from procurement. So nowadays innovation is an important part of any mature SRM practice and yet successful innovation capture from suppliers is reported to be patchy and the attention brought to it sporadic. So I often refer to the Deloitte global CPO survey of 2018 and innovation was considered a lower priority value lever than savings delivery, cost avoidance, procurement operating efficiency, supplier performance management, internal customer satisfaction and supplier compliance. So maybe we all agree that innovation is important but are not so sure about how to create the environment where it becomes a business as usual activity. So let me just kind of root innovation within SRM. So just a moment to define SRM. SRM is the deliberate pursuit and systematic management of post-contract value from an organization's key supplier relationships. So it's deliberate, it's systematic, and it's a systematic, that, that systematic application of a number of repeatable activities all designed to mine for additional value from engagement with suppliers. Now there isn't time to review what it takes to develop and set up cross-functional teams to create engagement strategies for specific suppliers, 
but it's worth taking a few moments to reflect on the typical outcomes from SRM. Firstly, there is the practice of protecting value. This involves contract and performance management, and the aim here really is to minimize value leakage. Moving on to value development, as you can see on the graphic on the right-hand side, this is about building on the good practices under, underpinning value protection, and as such is incremental. The focus here is in improving ways of working in order to generate savings and other value improvements. The question is always, can we, and that is including the supplier, do things better? And crucial here is that practitioners are skilled in convincing suppliers of the merit of collaboration whilst designing incentives like benefits sharing. More of that topic soon. And finally, value transformation which is kind of the fashionable end of SRM practice where collaboration with key suppliers can lead to innovation, transformative technology, core design and co-investment. It's all about, when you think about this SRM, it's all about managing value. If businesses are gonna to survive today's uncertain environment, then they're gonna to have to put continuous improvement and product and service innovation at the heart of their relationship management practices. So in this webinar, I'm going to focus on four key questions. Now, there are a number of other questions that people have submitted, which really are going to be included, I think, in the content that is going to follow. So the first question is, why is supply-enabled innovation important for today's procurement? Question two is about what is best practice in obtaining market innovation from vendors and potential suppliers? Three, who should be driving supplier-enabled innovation? And four, when challenging a supplier on cost, how do you also encourage real innovation in the relationship? So let's talk about why innovation is important first. Why do organizations seek to innovate? Well, fundamentally, it's about becoming more profitable and for the obvious improvement in shareholder value. To achieve this, the focus on innovation will varyingly be on cost reduction to make services and products more competitive and potentially profitable, to reduce risk, ensuring the business runs without interruption and as efficiently as possible, to gain more for less, to secure the best value from the supplier network and the internal workforce, to capture market share or uh, at least enter a market that's perhaps through the exclusive access to new supplier technologies, and to defend the organization ultimately from competitors. And I believe innovation is the outcome of creative endeavor at two fundamental levels. One at the business process level and two in the development of technology products and services. And these involve achieving the same outputs only cheaper and faster, stretching performance through making continuous incremental improvements in working methods to achieving outcomes that provide greater utility that's more value for potential customers by breaking the mold doing things differently as well as better and this may involve major reductions in cost but just as likely an increase in functionality and finally doing what hasn't been done with the organization services and products creating a potential transformation in cost but just as likely um, a, a transformation in the customer experience. So what is best practice? Well, defining that is pretty difficult, if not impossible. And it's because it's largely around being, it's sector dependent and it's circumstantially dependent. But these are some of the practices high performing companies apply in the innovation domain. Firstly, involving suppliers at the earliest stage of the design process. Whether it is designing a component for a complex technology or commissioning marketing campaigns from external suppliers, involving suppliers early on can be really helpful. It was once the norm to find buying companies designers creating final specifications before circulating them to potential suppliers. But now procurement is bringing pre-selected suppliers into the business to work with those designers and establishing multifunctional and multi-company design teams so that designs can be optimized and cost removed before it's built into a service or product spec. Early on in my career, I think one of the uh, one of my managers 
uh, once said to me is that 90% of the cost is designed in. So if we can bring the best suppliers in early on, we're going to develop not just the more the best functional solution, but also the one that leans towards being lower cost too. And why not really? Because external suppliers are even more so today experts in their field. They have access to knowledge and well-conceived ideas from servicing a variety of customers, often in other business sectors. So bringing such diversity of experience and thinking can help, really help, drive innovation. It's also about having a pragmatic or practical focus. And so back in Rolls, my Rolls-Royce days, I had a team around 15% of my headcount who would typically spend the working week at suppliers, studying the supplier's business processes to see where hidden cost and waste lay. They'd look for evidence of duplication and bottlenecks and rework following errors, scrap, and then internal KPIs that would look uh, showing unreliable uh, performance. All of the above would lead to an unnecessarily high cost base, if not well managed. So Rolls-Royce specialists would help set up teams at the supplier where ideas on how to overcome the supplier's shortcomings were encouraged. Anything that could be potentially lead to reduced cost or improved quality or delivery was considered before being prioritized and subjected to a full evaluation and then depending on the business impact implemented as effectively and as quickly as possible. And then finally, this notion of paying it forward. Realistically, everything that I've said so far can only be done if the buying organization has leverage in the relationship. In my day, considerable Rolls-Royce power was leveraged to secure cooperation. Simply suggesting collaboration was a good idea wasn't enough. You have to be able to harvest the results and to do that, power matters. But so does a willing supplier lead leadership. They have to believe that they will benefit too. In a sense, we were providing free consultancy with improvements past the Rolls-Royce, but with read across benefits enjoyed by the supplier who would apply those ideas to other customers in their portfolio. None of the work we were doing at that stage was uh, you know, really this process focused innovation, it wasn't really truly transformational, despite the cumulative value improvements that we gained were proving to be dramatic. Transformational technology wasn't our priority, as in a mature sector, value protection and value development held the greatest prizes for us. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be the same for everybody. But certainly this notion of incrementally building on protecting value and then continuous improvement. Certainly in my experience of dealing uh, not just uh, in, in my own uh, uh, leadership world at Rolls-Royce and elsewhere, but also in my consulting practice, uh, the biggest prizes still seem to come from doing what we do today, but better, faster, cheaper and more efficiently. I think back, just reflecting a little bit back in my Rolls Royce again for a moment, I think we could have been a little bit more generous on gain sharing. So I think people listening to this should really think about ensuring that any participating suppliers in your SRM or innovation campaigns, so they got to, you've got to keep them motivated, which is not always easy. There are some difficulties which I want to address um, just now. What are the hurdles facing organizations who seek innovation as, uh, see innovation as important, but find it difficult to sustain their attention on it? Uh, one example uh, from my own experience was where we introduced what we thought was going to lead to some good outcomes in respect of supplier innovation. At one of our regular supplier conferences, and we did this a lot, I announced that we'd be launching a supplier suggestion scheme, offering key suppliers the opportunity to bring forward their best ideas, but on a gain sharing basis. Although received at the conference with mild approval, I was pretty soon cornered by a number of chief executives who informed me that the company had proven to be a bit of a black hole for new ideas. They had in the past been multiple submissions of something's quite radical ideas to improve cost, of course, 
but also specification. They had gone nowhere. And what we found was that there was no process or resources allocated to managing the pipeline of ideas that came from suppliers at all. Suppliers were, as I've mentioned, from time to time asked by procurement to submit ideas, and yet there was no one available to evaluate, much less approve any changes. Designers in the company considered the supplier a nuisance. Evidently, the company was lacking absorptive capacity, essentially the ability to recognize the potential value of new ideas from suppliers, evaluate that value, assimilate the ideas, and apply them in the creation of more competitive products and services. So receptivity is absolutely key. There was also, um, in the case I'm thinking about here, but also I've seen it elsewhere in a number of organizations, there is a degree of corporate arrogance in that unsolicited submissions from suppliers was not considered a priority. So although there are obvious benefits of innovation, there are also costs. The allocation of human resources, seed funding of promising technology, evaluation process, and the potential moral hazard risk of securing technology from a single source that enables the supplier to later raise prices by virtue of the buying organization becoming over dependent. So my recommended prescription is to invest in ensuring that there is the necessary and sufficient capacity to take advantage of innovation from both inside and outside the organization. So who should drive innovation? I'm gonna come at this from two angles. First, from the C-suite. From the C-suite, key to any organization raising its game in fermenting innovation is establishing the right tone and the right culture. Moving from it won't work here to can we make it work? So questions such as, are we doing the right things? Can we do these things better? And what barriers are standing in the way of doing things better? And what can we do to overcome them are all useful, if not essential. Leaders have within their gift the opportunity to create this environment by democratizing creativity, encouraging mass participation, as well as sensible risk-taking by permitting failure. You know, some people say it's the hallmark of a learning organization. And one important practical step that can be taken by leaders in the C-suite is in providing a budget to functional heads so that specific time is allocated to new product design, normally not a problem, and evaluating possible changes to the service or product specification. The can we do this better question. It's for leaders from the C-suite to create an environment where ideas and innovation are valued and where significant importance is placed on problem solving and collaboration. For this, setting some goals and targets to promote the creation of ideas is to be encouraged. Knowing that progress on capturing supply innovation is being monitored helps keep everyone focused. Let me move on to procurement and the CPO. Well, selecting the right suppliers is key. Procurement supplier segmentation process will ideally recognize suppliers that have superior capability and an innovation record, and even a project pipeline where it might be known. But they also have supportive processes and resources to allocate to the innovation effort as well. This also includes the ability to understand emerging technology so that procurement knows which winners to back. So segmentation is key. Dedicated resources also helps. As I've mentioned at Rolls-Royce using process improvement experts, selected suppliers were invited to participate in breakthrough value workshops with the specific aim of challenging current methods, including the specification where possible, to capture those new ideas. The ability to generate ideas in a safe environment where there's a high degree of trust and without immediately leaping to judgment, released a lot of hitherto suppressed creativity. But motivating supplies is not without its challenges. Overcoming years of mistrust and frequently opportunistic and adversarial behavior, kind of demanding all the savings at once, 
uh, you know that requires a you know a passionate focus on the on the needs of really end customers both parties kind of have to accept that ultimately their success is going to be shared on the the result of the prime company and in my case in those days in rolls royce being successful in servicing customers so both parties have to deal with legacy issues that may be in the relationship for the supplier by demonstrating commitment to the customer and tackling the hard issues associated with improving performance and providing greater value can, can improve the pace and the depth of collaboration, paving the way for a freer exchange of ideas. Similarly, for the buying organization, recognizing that supplier may be a source of competitive advantage and not simply a servant to procurement's master can be a real paradigm shift. So convincing the suppliers that the zero sum paradigm that might have exist, existed for decades between the firms requires the demonstration of appropriate behavior, prohibiting commercial opportunism, for example, modeling collaboration, being predictable, maybe having confidentiality agreements if appropriate and so on. It also requires that incentivization. Benefit sharing is key and it's not always easy to achieve. CFOs need to be convinced that keeping suppliers in the game is just as important as maximizing savings in the short term. And procurement can't do this all on their own. Internal functions responsible for improving changes should, as mentioned earlier, have a budget to allocate to evaluating supplier ideas and other innovations and maybe with their own targets for innovation activity. The last question, uh, when challenging suppliers on cost, how do you also encourage real innovation? Well, there's some clues in what I've already been saying here, but some things to think about. Firstly, setting the challenge. How will you gain tangible results that help establish momentum and that will sustain everyone's interest and in time allocated to creative endeavors. Maybe agreeing a set of protocols that promote best practice, appealing to the supplier's leadership desire to improve, because in my experience, suppliers usually wanna do a good job. And to be honest, value improvements should ultimately be tracked to the bottom line. So measuring results is key, uh, whether to set formal targets and rigorously track progress, maybe the number of initiatives launched and completed, the value that's being created, patents applied for and secured and so on. And then my final word on benefit sharing, sharing the spoils. I work with several companies that have had clear guidelines on benefit sharing between the company and the supplier providing operational or more strategic innovation. And typically this has involved sharing the savings benefits 50-50 for say the first 12 months, and then either a sliding scale in favor of the buying organization or a straight 100% from 12 months plus one day. Some have negotiated 100% benefits to the buying company as soon as any change has been approved and then implemented. But my advice has always been and remains that we should always look out for mutual gain as sharing more equitably helps build goodwill and is more likely to ensure the supplier continues to invest in improvement and innovation practice the relationship and share future ideas so i hope this discussion on supply innovation has been useful and will help listeners steer a path through the myriad of priorities facing procurement because innovation is not the only thing we're worried about but also you know it really enable innovation to become a much more mainstream procurement activity and not a fringe issue that we dip in and out of from time to time <laughs>